Chow it's Observer here, and welcome to the review show of the internet that tells you if a game is worth collecting, emulating, or watching a YouTube walkthrough. And if you're just tuning in, I recently looked at The Incredible Hulk, the Pantheon Saga on the PlayStation 1. It basically takes everything great about the Hulk and strips it away. So you know what? We're no longer going to be looking at garbage games. We're actually going to be looking at a good superhero game. As promised, it's time to look at Spider-Man on the PlayStation 1. What the hell? Oh, oh what the hell? No, oh, what the... Anyway, don't play this game! Welcome, Zero. Who's there? I transported you and your apartment here. Transported me? Who are you? Where the hell am I? My name is K Dalash, and you are in the year 3120. This is a joke, right? Look outside the window if you don't believe me. I gotta check this out. What the hell's out here? Whoa! What the hell? Take me back home now! I can't right now. Not until you review a couple of games from your time. I need to capture your style of review and share it with the YouTubers from this time period. Whoa, wait a minute. So YouTube exists? Still? Why pick me? Sadly, someone who goes by the name 99 deleted all servers from the golden age of YouTube. Eliminating all history of YouTube during your time. The only remnant was some files from your channel. Zero X Shinobi. Uh, I still don't know why you need me. Since there's currently no standard on making gaming reviews on YouTube, it's simply now the largest corporate website where only playthroughs and live streams exist. We want you to review retro games like Mighty No. 9 and have us study your style. You must have been an unstoppable reviewer in your day. Please, Zero, help us. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying... You're telling me that Mighty Number no. 9 is a retro game? Some call it a classic and an innovator in the genre. So wait a minute. Can I emulate or uh, look up a YouTube walkthrough of Mighty Number no. 9 right now? Yes, I will transfer the file to your PlayStation 4 now. <laughs> Let's do this, shall we? Mighty Number no. 9 has some pretty interesting history behind it. It was first announced as a Kickstarter project by the designer of Mega Man, Keiji Inafune, who was involved in many of Capcom's most memorable titles during his employment there. Some works include Bionic Commando, Dead Rising, Lost Planet, and much more. Working as an illustrator, character designer, and later, executive producer for most projects he worked on, Keiji Inafune is experienced in the gaming industry. After his departure from Capcom, he decided to form his own company in 2010, under the name Concept. Focusing on concepts that are already established, Concept's mission statement is to take existing ideas and adding a fresh coat of paint to it. Why reinvent the paint when you can mix it up? So says KG Inafune. With years of development under their belt, now Concept's game quality seemed turbulent. Games like Soul Sacrifice are considered hidden gems for the PlayStation Vita, while Yaiba is considered to be... not good. In 2013, Keiji Nafune announced the game I'm reviewing today, 
the spiritual successor to Mega Man. Now I won't be getting into the 4 million plus dollars this game raised via crowdfunding, nor will I discuss the numerous delays, lack of communications with backers, poor marketing, or the disrespect shown towards the community via Dina Karam. I'm gonna focus on one thing, the game itself. So what is Mighty No. 9? If you're not familiar with the legendary Mega Man franchise, Mighty No. 9 is a run-and-gun platformer, meaning your primary objective in every mission is to move from left to right of the screen, mostly, shoot enemies down until reaching the boss, then defeat set boss. Boss battles are all one-on-one -on -one fights where our hero's skills are put to the test in a closed environment. That's Mighty No. 9 in a nutshell. So who is our hero? You control a robot named Beck who is deployed to check out an incident that have caused many robots to go rampage. Apparently the robots that now run amok were infected with some sort of virus. This virus has also spread across Beck's own line of Mighty Number series. The Mighty Numbers is a set of 9 combat units. Beck is known as Mighty Number 9 and his friends are the other 8. Each combat unit have their own specializations. Mighty number 1 is fire, 2 is ice, 3 electricity, 4 is a construction robot, number 5 is a military weapon, 6 is a flying newscast helicopter, 7 uses blades and acts like an awesome ninja, number 8 is a sniper who wants to run for president, and 9 is of course the jack of all trades who possesses the ability to absorb Cell. You see Cell I guess is data that makes up a robot's characteristics. Every robot has it in this world and is the main gameplay gimmick for this title. More on that later. After completing the first stage which introduces the chaos that this known virus has unleashed, you are given the option of tackling each of the 8 mighty number robot stages. Like I mentioned earlier, each robot specializes in something, so expect their stage to represent that. First off, I want to say that personally I find the stage selection in this game to be dull, boring, ugly, and lifeless. I don't want to make too many Mega Man comparisons here, but there's going to be a few in this review. When playing the original Mega Man games, the stage selection had personality in my opinion. Seeing the Robot Master's mugshots made me choose who to fight first based on their appearance. Here it seems like the stage is front and center, but the stage designs don't impress me. If anything, the artwork of this game is what should be front and center. Not this crappy 3D rendered stages. These robot designs are awesome. That's what made me buy the game honestly. The mugshots in this game are overshadowed due to the lack of color and being so small in comparison to the stage preview window. Again, this is just a personal gripe that I have. Nothing that impacts gameplay. Either way, select your first boss, but if you're like me, prepare to die a lot. Well, at least initially. At first I did believe the game was difficult. Sadly, once you beat one boss, the game's difficulty sways the opposite direction, becoming easier than say, Mega Man 8. I'll get to the reasons why, just bear with me. Beck can shoot, jump, dash, crouch dash, down dash, switch between his array of later obtained power-ups known as reselections, and grab onto ledges across the game's 12 stages. Sounds a lot like a Mega Man game, right? Well, what separates this game from the Mega Man series is the Zell absorption system. Remember when I mentioned that Zell makes up a robot's characteristics? Absorbing Zell, or Cell, allows you to temporarily use the strength of any defeated foe. To do so, you have to weaken the enemy by attacking them, then dash near them or through them. They work as the power-ups for this game. There's not many, but each are represented by four colors. Red boosts Beck's blaster power to shoot through multiple enemies. Green increases movement speed. Yellow, I believe, is more armor, but I didn't notice any difference in the normal difficulty. And finally, the blue Zell adds health to your life tank. Not only does dashing through enemies take them out along with granting you temporary buffs, but there's also a chain system in play. The combo meter is meant to... I have no idea. It's something that can be overlooked unless you're going for higher rankings. But again, I did not pay attention to it. On the other hand, the power-ups Beck can obtain by absorbing Cell is quite useful. 
Shooting through a multitude of enemies is especially satisfying, and the health tank system can be abused by absorbing blue zeal throughout each stage. Unless you completely suck, it will be hard seeing the game over screen after beating at least one boss. I died a lot in the beginning because I didn't know what each Zell awarded me. Once I found out how the Zell absorption system can work to my advantage, I felt like I had an unlimited supply of health. Side note, I ended up turning off the active cell effect that hovers over Beck's head. I mean, to me, it just looked really tacky. Now back to why beating one boss makes the game easier than ever. In Mega Man, you never, ever had hints on which boss order you had to play to make it easy on yourself. It was about assuming whose power weakened another. For instance, in Mega Man 1, you use the Mega Buster on Cut Man, then you move on to Elect Man, the Nice Man, followed by Fire Man. It's basically just a process of elimination as you obtain more and more of the Robot Master's powers using real world rules. Like paper, rock, scissors. That kind of works in Mighty Number no. 9, but what really kills the feeling of exposing a boss's weakness for the first time here is the game tells you everyone's weakness. Well, as long as you possess that power, that is. That's why I say it's easy once you unlock one power. Having the sword wielding robot brandish on your team, yes, beating a boss not only gives you their power, but they also join your team. Because remember, they are friends with Beck. Anyway, having him on your team will reveal in that stage selection screen that his weapon beats Dina. Beating Dina then reveals that she can beat Countershade. Countershade explains to Beck that he can take down Avi, and on and on and on, until you get to the final stages. You're probably saying zero. You can just not use the advice provided to make it harder. True, but there's more. The stage's overall difficulty becomes a lot easier as well. For example, in Avi stage, there's a segment where Beck, now with Countershade on your side, he takes it upon himself to shoot down everything in seconds, taking a room that can potentially kill you into just a normal room. This happens in every stage. During Pyro stage, you'll eventually encounter falling factory pillars, which can kill you in one hit. Having Avi on your side once again makes that set piece disappear. To me, a night and day difference in difficulty. <laughs> I'm coming for you, Iceman! Oh, hey, Iceman! Coming over to defeat you! Well, you can come and try, Zero. <laughs> oh, I will! Oh, by the way, um, you think I can get some directions on how to get there? Yeah, sorry about that. It's a uh, 45 snow drive. Awesome! Oh, uh, one more thing, uh... You think you can share your weakness with me? Yeah, just use Fireman's power and you'll have no trouble uh, against my ice. Great! Alright, see you there! Yeah, alright. Uh. <laughs> Fireman! Yeah! I'm taking a shot! Come on, let's jump this guy! Alright, just give it a minute, I'm coming out now! It may be worth noting that playing on the hard or hyper difficulty makes the hints and stage assistance parts go away. You just have to complete the game to unlock these modes. Other than the added ease when running through the game, a lot of the levels don't really impress me. There's a few standout ones like the highway stage which forces Beck to jump from one car to another in hopes of reaching the boss. Then there's the capital building. This stage has you hunting down a sniper. At first, it is frustrating running around for 6-7 minutes, dying, then getting thrown to the beginning of the stage all because the lack of checkpoints prior to the boss fights. But after familiarizing yourself with the stage layout and following where the gunfire is coming from, the stage is quite fun. The rest of the stages aren't as creative. Aside from the ones I mentioned, every stage feels like an industrial level. Every area feels similar to one another. To make matters worse, the music in each stage is not memorable. In fact, that's a problem with the soundtrack in general. The only tune that I find myself humming after beating this game is the main theme. You know, the theme that was used in the Kickstarter back in 2013. The amount of enemy variety in each stage is lacking as well. I'm almost certain enemy types aren't even in the double digits. 
they are super easy to defeat too. I don't recall ever dying by a regular enemy type, given how easy it is to refill your health. The primary reason I found myself dying would be thanks to the one hit death spikes found in most stages. If not that, then it will be due to another environmental trap, like pits. Platforming stages aren't also not too great. I guess playing real platformers that test my skill like say Shovel Knight or the 2D Mario game spoiled me. The dash ruins any real challenge platforming sections could have possibly provided. If you're not dashing past complete sections then you'll find yourself grabbing onto ledges to get to higher ground. I felt that mechanic also destroyed any chance of platforming difficulty. Mega Man never needed to grab onto ledges because it was a solid platformer at heart. Judging the distance between jumps and timing your leaps were essential to reaching a boss. Here, the combination of dashing endlessly and saving yourself with ledges negates any past Mega Man challenges. Speaking of ledges, there's something that really bothered me during a couple stages. During Zavi stage, you'll have to climb a lot of ladders. Some ladders are found in mid-air, with of course enemies blocking your progression. The weapon switching in this game is so bad that when you're on a ladder, you cannot select any of your weapons. So if you're using the Brandish Sword, and you find yourself on a ladder, guess what? You can't switch to your blaster. In fact, I found out later the only way around it would be to jump, switch to your desired weapon mid-air, followed by getting back onto the ladder. Don't just stand there, shoot him! I can't! And why is that? Damn it! I can't use my blaster when I have the, the sword equipped on the ladder! I can't switch! I have a great strategy to counteract that problem. Jump, switch to your blaster, then get back on the ladder. Hey! It's a good idea! Weapon switching in itself is a chore. You see, L1 is used to cycle through your obtained weapons, and Triangle selects your desired weapon. The shortcuts are your best bet since only 2-3 weapons are good anyway in the whole game. You're given the option of assigning 3 weapons to 3 separate buttons, Circle, L3, and R3 on the PlayStation 4. In the final stage, my multitasking skills were put to the test. There's a specific part where you have to use Avi's helicopter skill to fly through air current. Now, that is optional, you can dash through the air current to keep afloat, but using the helicopter weapon is pretty handy. There's also a few destructible platforms that is best destroyed by using Pyro's weapon. The whole room is about keeping afloat, destroying robots in your way, along with some regenerating platforms, until you reach the end. The problem I had was switching between the Avi and Pyro form, all while dashing through air current to prevent falling through the pitfalls. I know it doesn't sound hard, but honestly, this is all because I had to constantly use R1 to dash, L3 to switch to Avi form, then R3 for Pyro, back and forth. Like an idiot, I was using the D-pad to move back around. So moving my left thumb from the D-pad down to the left analog stick was weird. It was a brain melting moment, but only because I wasn't comfortable doing it. The segment wasn't hard, it's the weapon switching that was difficult to juggle for me. Story wise, I guess the game does its job. I can't complain about it because I have played games with far worse storylines. After completing a few levels, you're given some story bits that progress the overall narrative. Only thing I can really say is during the boss encounters, Beck would act as if he didn't realize his friends were infected by the virus. I mean, wasn't he given the objective in defeating them in the first place? Brand, tell me what's happening! Mech! And still operational! Just as the professor predicted! <laughs> you two! Now the final complaint that I must outline is the greatest difficulty spike in recent gaming memory. The final stage! 
I did state the game was difficult up until obtaining one boss reselection. After that, it became fairly easy. But that final stage has one goal in mind, to screw you over. Annoying flying enemies, pitfalls at every corner, and a final boss that forces you to master dodging everything to stand a chance. I must have fought this boss at least 30 times. During this fight, this moment, I realized how flawed the health tank system could be. If you have two health tanks filled, but you die, then you lose them both. Unlike the Mega Man series where you can store health tanks until you actually need them. After dying in the final boss battle, you're thrown back to the checkpoint, where the chance of getting a health tank filled again are low. Either Prey, the little robot helper found at each checkpoint gives you enough energy to refill the tank, or just restart the level. So do yourself a favor and never let health tanks go to waste. Hashtag just use it. I found that the easiest way to clear this stage without much trouble is to never unequip Pyro's weapon. Quickly dashing through each room while charging your explosion makes it easier. Unfortunately, the game seems to be prone to crashing when abusing his weapon. Wonderful! Here we go. I highlighted a lot of the issues I had with this game, but there's good here. I like the dash mechanic when it's used for traversing levels at high speed. I dislike using it to absorb cell, but movement is fast thanks to the dash. I also enjoy the cast of characters. Dr. White, Dr. Sanda, Blackwell, Beck, and his fellow combat units are all well designed in my opinion. I especially love how Call looks. I'm a huge role fan, and since we last saw her in 2010's Tatsunoko vs Capcom, I'll gladly take a look alike. When it comes to content, I find the game to be quite packed too. There's multiple difficulties that makes the game a lot better. On hard and hyper difficulty, I died a lot, even with all the power ups unlocked from the beginning and knowing every boss weakness. Then there's the boss rush mode, co-op challenges, which suck by the way, and single player challenges. It took me about 4 hours to beat this game, but I'm sure with the harder difficulties, I could get a lot more life out of this one. So there you have it guys, my review or rants on Mighty No. 9 on the PlayStation 4. Now it's time to get into my rating system, you know, the rating system that I use when I play these retro games. Based on three questions I ask myself, is the game worth collecting? Emulating or watching a YouTube walkthrough. Emulate. This is a tough game to recommend, but I still can't tell people not to play it. Whether you're a fan of the original Mega Man games or the X series, I still say check out Mighty No. 9 for yourself. Sure, mostly every level is dull, music doesn't compare to the original Mega Man games, and the final stage will test your patience, but there's a lot of potential for a great series here. If you're gonna play it, I say go in expecting an average game. And honestly, at the very least, it's better than Mega Man X7. Alright K-Dash, I did what you wanted me to do. I gave you the classic example of a YouTube review show back in my time, alright? So, I uh, appreciate if you can hurry up and get me back to my time period for I can review real retro games such as Spider-Man, if you don't mind. Actually, I need you a little longer. We need more data. What can I possibly review now? It's a SMT game with a hint of Fire Emblem on the side. <sighs> Now this is gonna be fun! <laughs>